This is my main question. What more do you feel the games in games and animation industry can do to reach out to the community of people from different demographics, such as ethnicity, neurological differences, or gender, and be more inclusive? What positive changes do you feel this has happened in the last 10 years? I think last year was really a turning point for many industries, not just animation and games, not only because of Black Lives Matter movement and what sort of has stemmed from that, but I also think there was a big shift in terms of thinking about people because of the pandemic. So what I have seen increase significantly is the amount of training that's related to awareness of let's just say people and inclusivity and diversity and interpersonal skills that go along with that so what has happened specifically I can say is for example screen skills have run many many different training courses now on inclusion and diversity and looking across the whole spectrum of things. I would say something like neurodivergence uh, was probably not discussed in the industry at all that I was aware of. I'm not saying it was never discussed, but I was aware of until last year. Access VFX ran a podcast on that. Uh, People, students started to ask me about it. So these are all things I think literally from last year to now have literally blown up in terms of discussion. They're the type of things I was already talking about years ago as an engineer, actually, and I'm still sure that engineering has to do more, but animation really wasn't talking about these things. And I've only just started working in games, but you know, I've been in animation for more than 10 years and they've really just started to talk about people skills in a big way over this last year. I've been talking about them for three years <laughs> um, and I'm really glad to see. And I, I'm, of course, I'm not the only one, but it was quiet on that front. And I now see that there's more and more discussion around it. So that's a huge change. Going back to the question of what can we actually do? I mean, of course, learning and going to workshops and understanding the types of issues that we have to tackle is fundamental. That That's one thing. And uh, learning as much as we can about the different things that people are, different situations that people are dealing with in their life, whether it's chronic illness, mental well-being, obviously uh, neurodiversity, ethnicity and what that means, gender and and what that means and and so on. Um, So learning and listening, (laughs) listening to people is absolutely crucial. And then, of course, all of this, I think, I think a lot of this goes back to schools, the younger generation and how we um, bring that in. So I know that an organization, for example, Access VFX is talking about having people go back to the schools that they went to, for example, and talking to the children there and showing the children, like being role models for the children and explaining like, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. And of course we have to go to more than the schools that we just came from because one of the problems with that is that our industry is also very much middle class in a way, right? If we want to talk about class yeah. system. So there's the socioeconomic diversity as well and how we, we reach out to children in parts of the country that wouldn't normally be even considering this kind of opportunity, or even if they're considering it, might not know how they could possibly get there. So, so much work to be done, but I would say the great news is there's far, far more discussion now than I've ever seen on all of these topics. What policies and safeguards are Studio putting in place to support people with mental health issues and people that are neurodiverse? I would honestly say that I, I've, I've been working for small companies generally in the last couple of years. If I go back to, so let's think about Dean Egg, which is the biggest company that I've worked for in animation. Dean Egg, when I was there, was, had an employee assistance program. And a, an employee assistance program is it's like having a human resources department that's outside the company. So if somebody's struggling with anything, that could literally be your finances. It could be a relationship, but it could also be related to your well-being in general. 
and your support and all of those things. It's like a telephone line, but it also gives you the opportunity of free face-to-face counselling. So that's one thing that they had. And other than that, I wouldn't say they were doing especially well in looking after well-being. But since then, they've actually set up that. So this is specifically for mental health. They've set up a group that meets every couple of weeks and they're discussing the policies all the time. Because I don't work there, I can't tell you the, the details of that. I'm working in a very, very small team at the moment, quite remote from a larger company. So it's, I couldn't tell you about my current company's policies, honestly. But that's what I know that DNEG have done since it's looking a lot healthier. If we look at ILM, so Industrial Light and Magic, they have now set up a, a specific group uh, based on uh, neurodiversity. They've set up a group on gender and sexuality and they've set up a group on mental health as well so being driven uh they're driving uh, ethnicity I, I don't know if i said that but ethnicity as well so they're they're driving now um change through setting up groups with people who are impacted to you know and, and help drive that change in the right way so ilm are doing that animated women uk have now set up a, a women of color group to support you know what we can do there there is, i mean there is so much more to be done but in terms of actual policy um again because of my being a bit on the outside of things now in terms of management it's it's quite hard for me to say anything specific in policy i can only say that first of all they they, they must adhere to law so anything that already exists by law they must adhere to but in terms of specific company policies i couldn't say but i can say change is definitely happening from what i can see discussions are taking place awareness is opening up so i think things in on the whole for me things are looking a lot better i i would say also people are thinking about training schemes and apprenticeships and internships paid internships of course so schemes where they can bring people in that come from diverse backgrounds. There's a story writing scheme being set up. This is specifically for people of colour, but there's um, so a writing scheme being set up. And that's to that's looking for new creative writing talent in the animation industries. And, and that's kicked off. So it's, it's people that are over 18, but that wouldn't usually have the opportunity to get into the industry. According to Harvard Business Review, neurodiversity could be a competitive advantage. Do you think being neurodiverse could be advantageous for a candidate's employment prospects? Why or why not? I think that that's probably very much down to the individual. Um, I mean, I might be completely wrong, but I feel like, I, I, of course, any individual uh on the planet is going to bring uh, something unique to a job. So that's the first thing to say. And so, of course, what is unique to any individual would be something that would bring something to a role. Um, but in terms of neuro, uh, like neurodiversity, I would say that different individuals are probably in very, very different situations, depending on whether they're dealing with uh, dyspraxia or Asperger's or, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. But obviously there will be certain aspects to that that would potentially enhance their ability to do a specific role. For example, there might be some people who are very, very, very focused and very precise when they carry out a task. And that might be something that's specific to that particular person that would make them really exceptional for a role where we're, you know, we're looking for for somebody to troubleshoot and and sort out technical issues and, you know, find the details and things. There there might be specific areas like that. So I would say that the main thing would be for the the individual themselves to highlight to the employer what it is that they think would differentiate them as a result of this might be something that an employer, if it was someone with dyslexia, say an employer might not feel that that person would be advantageous to their business just by seeing, just by hearing this person has dyslexia because of their own limited knowledge of it. But on the other hand, in the arts, there are many, 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 many people with dyslexia and they're incredibly creative people. So I think that, you know, the more that it's highlighted that, the, the range of sort of qualities um, people with you know with all different kind of diversity of thinking diversity of mindset diverse that that's the kind of diversity that any company would want I think and so the more that we can highlight it the better really but yes I, I mean I don't know if you agree Kieran but I do think that it has to be down to the individual as well to highlight because everyone's different I'm definitely yeah I definitely agree with that according to UK Screen Alliance 
women within the animation industries are taking 46% of the jobs and have for the most part nearly reached an equal basis with male employees, whereas they make up around 30% of the workforce in the game in the games industry according to the BBC. Is there anything studios can do to increase this figure? So in, in, the, in the games industry, I would look to schools and I would look to universities. What I would say about universities is, uh, so I'm going to talk about animation because, again, I don't know enough about the games industry. But, but animation courses have completely swung the other way. <laughs> and they're mainly female and, and that's really intriguing, like quite significantly so. So I, I don't think it's going to end up being about the number of people in the job uh, as such. I think a lot of it is going to be to do with some more complex issues that are, um, are people staying in the job? And if they're not, why? You know, do people want to stay in that role? And, and if they're not, why? How many people are in the senior positions in those companies? Now, at, at this point, it might just be that the increase is happening now and, and therefore it takes a little bit of time for the women to develop into the senior and just seat more senior roles. But I think it might be a little bit more complex than that. And, and I mean, that could be, I think there, there may be many issues behind that. If I was going to put my a word to it, well, there, there's maybe two things, and I don't want to speculate really. I would say that part of it is the fact that there's still maybe a bit of a boys club in terms of who gets promoted. That's one aspect. But the other aspect, I think, comes down to confidence in, a way, in women. And I, I think a, a lot of women around me and myself included, we, we often have a, a huge lack in confidence. And especially when we get into more senior roles, now, again, I can't say that that isn't the same for men. I'm speaking from the perspective of the women that I know, but I think that that's something that has to be worked on. And that's where like, the more role models we can pull up and promote, the, the better, really. And then, of course, um, being in a job, uh, we also have to talk about the pay discrimination and, and why is that? So is that to do with the senior role thing again, or is there something more complex going on? Just to explain to you that many, many people in the animation industry are freelance. And that means that they, they often ask for their own rate of pay. It, it's more a belief than a proof on my side. So I just have to state that and be honest. But I believe that women generally are asking for less money than men. And again, that comes down to confidence and self-worth. And, and most of the time, the students don't, uh, the, the studios don't speak up and say, hey, you're asking for less, you know. I definitely think so as well, because I've seen it's a lot of male figures are on top at the moment, but I think it's more of a generational thing and it's probably it's yeah. going to sort itself out in a few in next decade or so. Yeah. I, I mean, the only way it will sort itself out is by uh, women having uh, growing in confidence and having stronger voices. But I think all of the kind of movements that are happening now, all these discussions that are taking place. I, I have hope as well that these things will start to balance out, but it won't happen on its own. It has to. I discuss with women all the time, like very often they'll say things like, I don't really care if I'm paid any more than that. And I say, please care <laughs> because you're sort of setting the you're setting the level. It should all be. Better. I've seen loads of really talented women, especially on my course. Uh, like some of the most talented people in my class have been women. So definitely they're just as competitive. Absolutely. Currently, the animation and games industry is dominated by older males and is a male dominated industry. Although as demonstrated by HEPI, um, male students compared to female students ratio at arts universities is significantly lower. Do you think the animation and games industry is poised to become a female dominated industry in the future? You know, walking into those um, rooms, I would say it certainly looks that way. So you, I, I, many of the answers that I'm going to give you are not based on scientific fact. They're on my experience and they're on my own perception of what I see. So, of course, I'm not going to say don't quote me. This is why I'm here. But I, I have to say that I, I'm making maybe some some generalizations here. I I used to be an engineer and the, the men I knew from my engineering days, so that was like 19 years ago I left engineering. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've joined a lot of them on LinkedIn and so on. 
And most of the men that I know are in very, very similar jobs to the ones that they were then. Most of the women that I knew in engineering are in very different jobs to the ones that they were in then. And I have changed my career path in a way multiple times and I've got other female friends who are quite often thinking what else could I do so it's something that's intriguing for me is do women tend to follow a more varied career path is if I was going to put if I was going to talk about myself here what I would say is that I feel like life is so diverse and interesting and there's so many different experiences of it I want to have even in my career and more men that I know have tended Again, like I've got statistical proof, but more men that I know have tended to stick to a specific role and a specific task. So, for example, men that I know that storyboards almost all the time and they've done that for many, many years. I see a little bit more diversity, I think, in, in the sort of roles that women are, are taking on in life or, or even having these hobbies on the side that are almost like another job like you know I've got a friend who's jewelry making and 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 that sort of thing so it's interesting to me if if these things play a part in the the long-term balance within the industry but it'll also be interesting in terms of whether what's happening in university is reflected in the workplace of course women are also the people that carry children you know so again you know generally you know we're going to have that's going to be a long a very very long-term situation so again what impact does that have in the long term in this particular industry I don't know because I think many of us know that this particular industry can sometimes demand hard work outside of working hours yeah definitely I've seen um, I had a lecture last week and they mentioned about the hours people have to put into film when they do cg and things like that yeah and it's not always the case and i'm not doing long hours in this job for example um which i'm really grateful for but it can tend to happen so i guess a lot of it will also come down to the kind of commitments that women might have that are outside of work i mean that everyone in a way should have but you know this is these are all the different factors that are going to impact it like is there something in terms of the difference between women and men and and how they want to stay on a particular path maybe there isn't and I'm just you know that's my own perception or you know will the the fact that women are are generally the the ones that are more likely to be looking after the children is that going to impact things and of course they're the people that are going on the longer maternity leave in this country at the moment so all, all of these things come into question and then you know looking at getting into those more senior roles as well that you would think that that would be happening more and more regularly and I really hope so but I, at the moment it, there's still a long long way to go in terms of the creative roles women are going into the production roles but the creative ones not so much and we've seen that- I've actually <laughs> seen those statistics online um what's strategies are studios using to ensure that people of different ethnicities and gender are getting the same um, representation and chances of employment as um, male white individuals? Um, I, I would say up to now there wasn't a huge amount of work being done in the studios again to really go out of the way to find that balance. What I what I would say is so I went to, I attended BAFTA's diversity panel recently and they discussed the 2019 uh, survey results uh, that were were done in animation industry, animation and VFX. And so in terms of the number of people of colour in the UK, they were either hitting that or very, very close to hitting that in terms of percentage. So in other words, within the industry, it was something, there's 14% people in colour, people of colour in the UK, and within the industry, it was it was hitting that in animation and it was exceeding that in VFX. But then there was a study done last year that made it look like it was slightly different. The, the unfortunate thing is with these studies, they're, uh, with these surveys, they're, they're carried out in, in different ways of, of uh, sampling. So in different ways of actually recruiting the people who take part in the survey. So sometimes it's a company asking their employees and sometimes it's, it's a survey that's put out, say, on the web and people can do it voluntarily. And, and I think that these things, they already bring some kind of bias into the results in a way. How you actually measure and sample that is already tricky. But I wouldn't so much say it's about the numbers. I think the numbers are are one aspect of it. 
But if we move away from numbers, we have to think about the roles. So what are the diversity of roles? Who's, who are in the pos positions for decision making? In terms of the representation on the actual screen, how does that look? Are the representations of people from different ethnicities, genders, neurodiversity, disability and so on, are they well represented and authentic? I think that these are the slightly deeper things that we have to look into rather than numbers I, and again like numbers can also it, it's very tricky if we just think about numbers because we can say great we we brought in three more black people into the studio but we might also realize that as I said, you know, we're, we're not thinking about people from a very poor socioeconomic background. And so I, I think that we have to be, how to look at it for me is we cast the net really wide. Also, I'll tell you something else that I think is really important is engaging parents uh, of children uh, in the belief that this is a career that will actually be a, a positive career for their children. Because I, I think that you know, it, it, we could think of that in terms of culture, or we could think of that in terms of maybe a parent thinks that their child's not suited to that for whatever reason, or that they're not going to earn any money, they're going to be very poor, or that they just think, oh, that's a joke, that's a way, that's a dream, that's a way out there, and that doesn't really happen in real life. I, I think engaging parents and having parents encourage their children to work in these industries is something that would also be really um, impactful actually but but it's not a, so so numbers is is one thing but it's it's much more than numbers it's it's role models mentoring the the depth of awareness that we would have representation on the screen discussing with children discussing with their families and and making this whole industry feel like something that's really a, a thriving industry for people in general that's where i that's what i want to see happen